Hi there, my name is Matthew Carson with the Open Source Energy Network. We're very excited to be bringing these testimonies before you today, but first of all we'd like to thank the Disclosure Project. The Disclosure Project has spent a couple years and over a quarter million dollars acquiring these exceptional energy testimonies from trailblazers in the clean, free, renewable energy field. These testimonies are testimonies. They aren't simply interviews. They have been documented with affidavits and documented credentials. These people have important things to say about the current state of energy as it is in the world today. Please listen carefully, watch carefully, share these videos, disperse them amongst your friends, email the links around, but make sure to donate directly to the Disclosure Project today and keep in mind that these are not fictional interviews or showbiz articles. These are testimonies that we hope and the Disclosure Project hopes will eventually stand in a court of law. Thank you. The anti-gravity, electrogravitics and zero-point energy uh, research that I'm aware of, I would feel that um, uh, recently I just met Bob Lazar and had a very nice conversation with him in Las Vegas. So I feel even more confident of his sincerity and his experience at S4 uh, in Groom Lake, um, Area 51 for those who are not aware of it. Uh, S4 is actually south of Area 51. But um, the important thing is that from his experience alone, the um, uh, very convincing picture of very advanced circular aircraft or circular levitating craft um, becomes very apparent and this advancement in propulsion and anti-gravity um, has not been really available to the civilian population virtually at all. Um, we know of uh, work done by Townsend Brown, for example, uh, which actually I recently published in Atlantis Rising uh, magazine. Um, and Townsend Brown specifically proved through his demonstrations on Project Winter Haven that the um, possibility of providing a unidirectional force from a charge separation on a craft, especially design craft, uh, is feasible and importantly it also um, cushions the supersonic um, uh, braking effect. Well, electrogravitics by itself is specifically the um, propulsion effect that's gained by a, a separating charge on the edge or the surface of an aircraft. And, and I use aircraft um, in a very general way to mean spacecraft or any other type of craft. Um, the interesting thing is from my research, I also feel that there's a um, magnetogravitics uh, available as well. In fact, Dr. Li Ning Li in the latest Popular Mechanics magazine uh, has that term used in her research. So uh, there's both options available for providing gravity anomalies. And this, I feel, is um, an, a very viable area of research. Uh, interesting research that now is being uh, suggested by uh, Boyd Bushman uh, from the uh, Lockheed. He's retired from Lockheed. And um, he describes uh, some of that research that he's willing to talk about. And of course, an anti-gravity effect that he's also uh, witnessed and measured. You're asking about the um, unacknowledged programs. And <clears throat> I, first of all, would like to uh, describe the, um, the fact that many people feel, and including politicians and senators, have been quoted on TV recently, for example, the Billion Dollar Secret um, that was aired on the Learning Channel for two hours. They interviewed, uh, I believe it was Senator Murkowski from the um, uh, Energy Committee, and he specifically said this was a waste of taxpayers' money to have covert operations that have developed advanced technologies in this energy or propulsion area, and then NASA is also getting tax dollars to do the same thing all over again. The parallel development, he felt, was a waste of taxpayers' money. Uh, I've seen other senators say the same thing. In fact, that particular senator requested um, information from the president about such covert operations. For example, the UFO uh, sightings for decades now have cited the fact that all these crafts seem to move in very irregular, fast-changing patterns. And for any craft to do a fast-changing pattern means that they're experiencing perhaps tens of Gs inside the craft if it was a normal uh, inertia bearing type of uh, material craft. But what's obvious is that they do it so effortlessly and can change direction so quickly 
that very likely they're not a, being thrown against the wall of the craft as it's changing. Uh, more likely, in fact, from the book that I just um, read recently, do, Dr. Paul Hill, who was a NASA scientist um, on conventional flying objects, he describes the fact that as you're producing a small anti-gravity force downward, uh, approximately 1G worth, that the inhabitants, um, the occupants of the craft, all they're experiencing is a force downward. They can be sitting there very comfortably eating their lunch or whatever, and meanwhile the craft is going through all kinds of gyrations. And specifically using that ground uh, downward force to brake and to um, bank, as well as to accelerate upwards. Um, I believe the state of the art, just from my own personal opinion, of the uh, covert black project unacknowledged um, um, aircraft or spacecraft <coughs> or circular craft is as Bob Lazar describes. Um, he describes uh, more than a dozen different circular craft that are operational at Area 51. He's seen more than one tested and hovered. Um, I have heard rumors, for example, that we have bases on the moon and Mars already. Um, it's very likely we do. Because when you think of the fact that if you have a craft that you can get into and travel very quickly with no fuel, this is an important fact. We now in America realize that we can only no longer survive on oil consumption. We're at the point now where we need an extra 1% every year to survive. Um, my wife and I just completed a, a study of the Department of Energy's Comprehensive National Energy Strategy. It took us almost a year to do the entire book. The interesting thing is that OPEC is not about to or even capable of increasing their oil exports. They recently decreased 1.2% last year, and that caused all our oil prices to go haywire. So we're at the point now where we have to demand free energy. The public doesn't really understand what free energy is, but I believe it's already available through zero-point energy uh, converters. And so at Area 51, for example, S4, we understand that uh, there is a possibility for, for this type of propulsion, for this type of energy conversion, so that they're getting energy and propulsion inside one vehicle. Um, the fascinating thing about zero-point energy is, to just step back and explain it, is that zero-point energy essentially is the energy that the vacuum possesses as we go down to a state of zero gas, zero heat, uh, and, and zero pressure. So the conversion of zero-point energy is probably happening all around us. I just listened to a talk by Tom Bearden recently, who also says that zero-point energy is constantly being converted. I met another scientist at the Institute for New Energy a month ago that told me the same thing. From his research, uh, for decades of work, uh, in Martin Marietta and other places, he felt that zero-point energy was something more apparent than we even know is, is real. So right now, we're discovering that there are ways to not only get heat out of the vacuum, uh, Hal Putoff published a physics review article on that. Um, we can also get energy out of the vacuum, according to his theory. And it's very possible that we can provide some kind of force from the vacuum energy. I would say that the motivation or, or the motive for the Patent Office to be suppressing uh, various types of energy inventions is certainly motivated by other government agencies. And other government agencies, uh, even for example, the American Physical Society, um, benefits by certain government grants. I think the motive also within the Patent Office is to save face. So I literally lost my job at the Patent Office for trying to educate the public and the examiners on new energy inventions that could save our planet, that are carbon-free and fuelless. Um, when we particularly look at the um, next 20 years, <coughs> we're relying upon the import and usage of about uh, 20 million gallons, 20 million gallons, 20 million barrels of oil per day, and we import about half of that from OPEC. Um, we're unfortunately in, in the uh, very strongly dependent mode of thinking that that flow of oil, uh, which is a huge amount of oil, is infinite and will continue to flow in, indefinitely. Um, the best experts, and I've consulted various books, including Wa World Watch Society, predicts that around 2010 we're going to peak in the world um, resource availability and then we'll see a slow decline. Well, just a few months ago, actually one month ago in September, uh, the OPEC nations got together for the first time in 25 years. And when OPEC got together, they basically didn't respond to either the United States or the European nation demand for increased output. 
Instead, they basically said, we'll supply a uh, steady output at a fair price. And so what I believe is happening, and I suppose there are other critics as well that will analyze the situation, knowing that there is a peak coming up and a forced decline, the best way they can profit, since they hold two-thirds of the um, world's uh, um, oil res uh, reserves, is to essentially cut back 1% like they did last year now instead of later. And by doing that, they force prices up artificially high and essentially uh, get us ready for being weaned off of this um, uh, biological fluid. And, and when we realize what we're doing to the atmosphere as well by being dependent upon this dead fossil remains from our ancient history, that now we're forcing that carbon up into the atmosphere, um, our carbon dioxide levels have now surpassed 300 parts per billion for the first time in 400,000 years. And that's been verified by work at the National Atmospheric Centers. So what we realize is that we're all of a sudden now importing into the atmosphere a high, highly potent greenhouse gas that is scheduled to uh, double within about 50 years. Our energy consumption demand and, and has to have 20% more within 20 years. We don't know where that's going to come from. And if we expect that OPEC's going to provide it, we're going to be sadly mistaken. And I believe that a war for oil is, is scheduled in our, in our near future, especially when a presidential candidate says we're going to be a hardliner against OPEC to demand more oil. Who are we to demand from somebody who controls the market? So I think uh, essentially that our human race to survive has to have free energy. We were at a collision course right now. Our economy cannot ex expect to expand. Um, our propulsion industry, firecrackers going up in the air to send a little 1% of our space uh, payload to, uh, to a near-Earth orbit is, is a huge waste of money. Um, so I, I feel very strongly that free energy and anti-gravity are very imminent and that there are a lot of inventors that have uh, put together the basis for this type of uh, new energy future, and it's just a matter of us getting investors together and doing the work. So we have a very um, um, good future to look forward to, but it involves new thinking and getting rid of the old um, meter uh, J.P. Morgan mentality, where we have to pay for our energy consistently month after month and gallon after gallon.